Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here with CHP episode 164. This is the fourth installment in our little overview of the life of Joe and Lai. And talking about Joe and Lai, I can't help but revisit many of the same stories and events from past episodes. This time in part four, we're going to pick up in July 1943 when Joe and Lai was recalled back to Yan'an. This was all covered in more detail than I'm going to offer you today in the back-to-back John Service and Chinese Civil War series. Uh, that was CHP episodes 115 to 122. We also discussed this period in the Kangsheng CHP 11 episode and in the award winning eight part Deng Xiaoping series. So I don't think we need to rehash everything in detail yet again. What a rip roaring time this was, especially looking at it in hindsight from the American perspective. This period we're looking at today, 1943 to 1949, what a multitude of stars. FDR, Henry Wallace, Vinegar Joe, George Marshall, Patrick Hurley, John Service, and the whole Dixie Mission, and of course Stalin. And on the China side, Chiang Kai-shek and the Songs and the entire pantheon of CCP leaders and greats from Mao on down, all playing roles in one central drama. And central to this central drama, wherever the action was happening, was Zhou Enlai. Now, at this point, it had already been about eight years since the CCP set up the party center in Yan'an, in northern Shanxi province. Zhou had been working daily with Mao on political, military, foreign relations, and organizational affairs. If you figure... It was around 1935 when Zhou hitched his wagon to Mao for keeps. Quite a lot of time had passed, and their working style was very developed by now. In 1940s Yan'an, Mao was by then the unchallenged top guy. After Zun Yi, he rose to the top, but he still had contenders. One such contender was, and had always been, Zhou Enlai. We already established back in part one, Zhou wasn't a dictatorial type or power-hungry. But even so, he was a very respected senior party leader and had a very impressive CV. He may not have had aspirations to lead in the sense that Mao, Chang Guotao, Bo Gu, Wang Ming, and others did. But his words mattered and carried a lot of weight. Mao couldn't push Zhou Enlai around or take him down by himself. So we left off last time with Joe's recall to Yan'an in July 1943. The Yan'an rectification movement, or campaign, was at its peak. The whole movement was all about Mao consolidating his power and taking a first organized stab at rooting out all his enemies and suspected enemies. When the last body was counted, about 10,000 people were put away. This was the first ideological mass movement of the Chinese Communist Party. And it wouldn't be the last. Just prior to Zhou's arrival in Yan'an, the Comintern had been dissolved. That tortured organization for years tried and failed to assert its control over the levers of power in the CCP. Stalin tried, but he never took Mao seriously. And like all great leaders do from time to time, he didn't play his cards right and had to pay a price when his guy... Bo Gu and later Wang Ming didn't take the top spot. Mao and Stalin may have been brothers in Marxism-Leninism, but they were never good friends. In fact, they couldn't stand each other. Stalin was 15 years older than Mao. So the common turn folded. As we discussed last episode, Joe had convinced Stalin in 1939 to get on board with Chairman Mao and the current CCP leadership slate. And when Stalin caved... That meant the opposing Comintern line, led by Wang Ming, were thrown under the bus and defanged. But that wasn't enough for Mao. It wasn't enough to win. All those comrades who were too late placing their bets had to come in for a little examination by the party. The process you had to go through was pretty harsh, man. It involved a lot of self-criticism and criticism from others. As I said... 10,000 people didn't survive the process. So so how you feared when it was your turn to take that walk of shame and get put through the ringer determined not only your future in the party, but whether you lived or joined the 10,000. So Joe had to take his turn like everyone else, and in the grand scheme, unlike comrades like Liu Shaoqi, Bo Yibo, and Peng Jun, 
As far as Mao saw it, Joe was a little late in accepting his leadership in the party. We all know how he signed up in 1935, but prior to that, Joe sort of played it both ways and could be said to have, at times, supported the 28 Bolshevik common turn line. So Joe had to pay a penalty for cavorting at one time with Wang Ming. Joe also faced criticism for other past acts. Both Joe and Chen Yi, for example, had to answer for their handling of intellectuals. Joe himself had, because of his education and erudition, had always been pigeonholed as an intellectual. It was no secret that he had come to the defense of more than one Jishir Funzi. Though it wasn't his fault that the whole thing went down like it did, he also got a tongue lashing for the outcome of the new Fourth Army incident in January 1941. It was a rough six weeks for Zhou Enlai, but he knew how to handle these things. He kept his head at all times. He knew what to say. Mao really wanted to make sure that those comrades like Zhou, who came a little late to his side, were totally signed up. Zhou survived the ordeal. You may recall from the Kang Sheng episode, Mao had allowed Kang to really turn up the heat as far as going after any possible naysayers. So out of control and violent was Kang Sheng's ten-month reign of terror that Mao had to step in and tell Kang Sheng to knock it off. And not only that, Mao apologized for his friend's behavior. You see, Zhou Enlai wasn't the only one who had complete loyalty and devotion to Mao Zedong. So did Kang Sheng. And it was thanks to Kang Sheng Mao got to ditch his saintly third wife, He Zhejun, and acquired the Shanghai movie star Lan Ping, a.k.a. Li Shu Meng, a.k.a. Li Yunhe, a.k.a. Jiang Qing. When all the top comrades in the CCP told their leader she was not Madame Mao material, Kang Sheng made it easy for Mao to rebuff his closest comrades. So Kang got off with a slap on the wrist for his overly enthusiastic prosecution of his fellow comrades during the Yan'an rectification movement. By the time the whole thing wound down, the all-powerful, all-knowing Chairman Mao we have all come to know was born. Not only did he emerge from this rectification movement as the undisputed leader and figurehead for the whole CCP movement, his Mao Zedong thought, a term coined by Wang Jiaxiang in 1943, became the guiding light of the party. And it's about... Here, where the seed got planted that led to the deification of Mao that reached its apex in the Cultural Revolution. Right about here, it started to plant roots. The next big item on the agenda after this was all over was the United States. Yeah, 1943, we know what's coming. This is where my fellow Americanskis clumsily walk into this quagmire of a political situation. World War II was at its halfway point about now, and America was fighting wars in both Europe and the Pacific. And China was key to the war in the Pacific. The belief was that the Chinese military had to keep Japan tied down fighting. They could not allow the Japanese military to advance any further than they already had. Defeat was not an option. And Uncle Sam had to do whatever they could to keep China in the war and support them in their efforts against the Japanese aggressors. A great help was Lend-Lease that had been turned on in March 1941. That turned into one of the great profit centers of all time for those favorably placed along the supply chain. And from those John Service episodes, we all know how that went. As early as 1943... Joe and Lai already knew every effort must be made to woo the Americans and get some of that lend lease supplies heading in Yan'an's direction. Joe understood the politics and how the media was reporting the war in China. The narrative that Jiang wasn't getting the job done was already an old story. There was regular talk about Jiang and his cronies pocketing all these proceeds from black-marketed U.S. Lend-Lease aid and not taking the fight to the Japanese. Joe knew this well-worn narrative was ripe for political exploitation. Remember, the second United Front had already broken down, but the U.S. was going to pull out all the stops to do the impossible and drive the two opposing parties to join together to fight Japan. In this, Joe saw an opening. He skillfully played up the communists' 
unfettered support for the notion of fighting Japan. He saw how the Americans were pointing their fingers at Jiang and stamping their feet, so it became even more important for the communist armies to carry out actions that could be pointed to later on as proof to the Americans when they came that the communists could be a serious and reliable ally. And all along, while Jiang was sitting on his hands, they were taking the fight to the Japanese. And so began the whole tortured but thoroughly entertaining period of the Dixie and Marshall missions. The Dixie mission ran July 22, 1944 to March 1, 1947. George Marshall's ill-fated mission ran concurrently with the Dixie mission from December 20, 1945 until January 1947. It was only natural that the party leader chosen to spearhead this effort to obtain American aid and support be Joe N. Lai. All his experience dealing with Western people and the training going back to his Europe days had well prepared him for what lay ahead. A lot of American military and political figures will be meeting him and talking to him. It seemed at least up till 1943 that whoever met Joe and Lai liked him immediately. The overwhelming majority, if not all, of the Western people who got to meet him were either intellectuals or political figures. Over the past couple decades, Joe had perfected his style. He was very charming, disarming, persuasive, and effective. But this really was a mission impossible. And we all know, of course, from past episodes that indeed it was an impossible mission. Joe had more faith than Mao did as far as winning some sort of recognition from the Americans. But Mao knew and Joe knew about halfway into the Marshall mission that the Americans as well-meaning as they were, just didn't understand the politics or the current dynamic in China. They had to choose one. It was either choice A, Chiang Kai-shek and the KMT government, or it was B, Mao Zedong and the communists. And Zhou Enlai knew from everything that had happened since 1927 that the Americans, through their actions, were always, 100% of the time, lined up behind the KMT. They never once purposely sided with the CCP. June 1944, around the time of D-Day, Joe invited a gaggle of reporters up to Yen'an to come check out and see for themselves what a great bunch the communists were. Well, easier said than done. June 1944, we're still thick in the Chongqing period in Joe's life. He's still operating out in the open in Chongqing by mutual agreement forced upon Jiang as a direct result of the Xi'an incident the communists operated openly in Chongqing, but they were constantly harassed, and the more important ones were always followed. There was always a detail assigned to Joe, but no attempts had been made to take him out. After all, everyone knew it was mostly thanks to Zhou Enlai that Jiang was still alive. So for Jiang to return the favor by having Zhou Enlai assassinated, that really would have been bad form. Zhou had been gone from Yan'an for 15 months. During this time in Chongqing, as the communist representative, he operated the Southern Bureau of the party. And with the heat on Zhou all the time, it wasn't easy to achieve what he did with respect to propaganda, being the acceptable face of the CCP, recruitment, infiltrating KMT departments and agencies, running the occasional black op. He was busy, but he wasn't too busy to make time to see Vice President Henry Wallace when he came a-calling in June 1943. This was how it all got started. You recall from those John Service episodes, the drumbeat became so excruciatingly loud calling on the U.S. to go see the communists that Roosevelt, after Stilwell's strong recommendation, told his vice president, Henry Wallace, to go take a look-see. Jiang was able to put the kibosh on those Western journalists going up to Yan'an to go listen to a bunch of CCP propaganda. But where FDR was concerned, he still couldn't say no to him. But when Wallace stopped by Chongqing in June 1944, Jiang gave him an airfall. He was in a foul mood because all the promises made to him by FDR and Cairo had evaporated. But when Wallace insisted that some kind of American observer mission be allowed to visit Yan'an, Jiang had to surrender to the inevitable. Keeping the Americans and communists apart in any official kind of capacity was one of Jiang's main missions. Jiang understood the Americans well enough to know that they'd probably fall 
for all the communist BS and that Joe and Lai would hypnotize them and win them over to his side. So a month later, after Wallace's insistence, the Dixie Mission flew to Yenon. This group was led by Colonel David Barrett with none other than John S. Service at his side. They landed in Yenon on July 17, 1944. In charge of the whole mission for the CCP was Joe and Lai. He was in charge of all the negotiations, details, as well as keeping sight of the big picture. Joe and Mao knew this wasn't going to amount to much in the end, but they gave it their best. Joe put together two teams. The first team included Ye Jianying, Huang Hua, Chen Jiakang, and the immortal George Hatem, Ma Haida himself. They handled all non-military affairs and were in charge of answering questions from the Dixie Mission members. The second team had a few CCP military heavyweights, Peng De Huai, Chen Yi, Lin Biao, Nie Rong Zhan, and He Long. For something this big, Zhou had all his starters in the game. Ye Jian Ying met the Dixie Mission when they landed at the airport. They were wined and dined, Yan'an style, and got the full treatment. Mao and Zhou lobbied Barrett and Service personally for hours on end about getting some U.S. military aid. Joe repeated again and again that the communists were only willing to join with the KMT to finish off Japan if they were respected as a partner. Jiang had all along refused to allow this. And as a little bit of an incentive to give the Americans something to fulminate about, Joe did something that Deng Xiaoping would do 35 years later. Joe made it known in so many words that when this was all over... China was going to need a lot of help to make things right again. And wouldn't it be great if uh, the Americans helped out now in order to get all this preferential treatment later? Joe spoke about reaping a rich harvest one day in China trade and investment, finance and construction projects. And, of course, China would much rather be warm and cozy with the Americans than the Soviets. He was very convincing. Joe had choreographed a masterful show, and when Barrett and Service's plane disappeared into the northern Shanxi sky, there were high fives all around. Barrett and Service had sent back glowing comments about what a great bunch of guys the commies were, not to mention how surprisingly helpful they were with respect to military and intelligence information in North China. Then, several months later, in November 1944, the Patrick Hurley phase began. Jiang couldn't kick himself enough for suggesting to Roosevelt that he send an envoy to China to help with the communication and allow him to go around Stillwell. Once Hurley arrived, whatever hopes Joe and everyone else in Yan'an had about possible American cooperation went right up in smoke. The amazing thing was, it all went up in smoke, but it kept on going for another three years. Joe tried to build a relationship with Stillwell and reached out to him, but no sooner had they started talking when Stillwell got recalled. You all remember that incident. Wallace came back from China and told Marshall he had to recall Stillwell. It just wasn't working out between him and Jiang. And rather than listen to the vice president, Marshall instead put Stillwell in charge of all armies in China over Jiang Kai-shek. That led to a blow-up that led to Stillwell being recalled to the U.S. in October 1944 and replaced with General Albert Wedemeyer. Joe Enlai tried in vain to contact FDR via letter, but that, of course, didn't work out. No way that arrow was going to be allowed to make its mark. This left the CCP stranded. And even though American acceptance and cooperation was the longest of long shots, Joe still fought hard to get it. The only... Official links to the U.S. government were all decidedly in the pocket of the KMT. So, 1945 and 46, the United States tried and tried to bring about some sort of peace between the KMT and CCP. The more they tried, the more they kept missing the mark. Joe and Mao knew the Americans were never going to come to their side. If you recall, Joe had outmaneuvered the uninformed and terribly naive Patrick Hurley when he got Hurley to sign a five-point plan that gave Mao the one thing he had always demanded, independent control over his armies. Jiang had never agreed to that before, and he wasn't agreeing to it now. So when Hurley left Yan'an and went back to try and sell the plan to Jiang, 
The Generalissimo told him to go fly a kite, so Hurley had to go back to Joe and say the whole thing needed to be renegotiated. This five-point plan quickly became a dead horse that Mao kept kicking for two years. There followed 43 days of talks between both sides in Chongqing that led nowhere. There was bad faith all around, and everyone knew everyone was double-dealing. Hurley was being downright belligerent because Mao and Joe wouldn't agree with him. Then once FDR died in April 1945, that sure changed the dynamic. No more free ride for the KMT. As soon as Harry S. Truman got all comfortable behind FDR's old desk, it became apparent to all he wasn't a young man. Around the time of Roosevelt's death, the 7th Congress of the CCP took place, the Chita. This was the Congress where Mao, beyond the shadow of a doubt, was made the top guy in the Central Committee, the Politburo, and the Military Council. The new party constitution mentioned Mao's name no less than 105 times. When it concluded, the ranking in the party went Mao first, Liu Shaoqi second, Chu De third, and Zhou fourth. Not long after the Japanese surrender, Mao was invited down to Chongqing for talks. Just like with Liu Bei and Zhuge Liang, Jiang had to ask Mao three times before he agreed to come. And this is where he makes his first ever trip in an airplane. Mao famously made Hurley, who was still up in Yan'an, fly down there with him just in case any of Jiang's agents had any ideas to blow up the plane. Mao and Jiang met face to face 11 times, always talking general matters, leaving all the details to Zhou. Zhou had gone to extraordinary lengths prior to Mao's arrival and during his stay in Chongqing to make Mao out to be the future statesman that he was. With respect to Mao's security, the channels available to communicate with him, his meals, everything, Zhou made a big fuss in front of everyone and put on a very fine show as far as, you know, building up Mao's face and dignitas before all the major players in Chongqing. You know, Mao was... A little rough around the edges. I guess you could say you can take the man out of Shaoshan, but in Mao's case, they couldn't get the Shaoshan out of the man. So Zhou choreographed everything, so it always put Mao in a you know, respected, dignified, and sophisticated light. Seven months after FDR died, Patrick Hurley still couldn't deliver on all his promises to bring these two sides together. In the face of a long-running diplomatic failure, Patrick Hurley resigned in a huff. That was all discussed in detail in those John Service episodes. A few weeks after Hurley left, General George Marshall arrived. With Marshall, the U.S. government was really sending in some major firepower. He hadn't been immortalized yet with the Marshall Plan, but he was still a very high-ranking and respected figure. A lot of hopes, in the U.S. at least, were placed on the success of this mission. The Civil War was still ramping up. Marshall was trying to negotiate a ceasefire. As soon as Japan surrendered, Mao gave the order to mobilize the Red Army against Jiang. Zhou drafted the order, known as Directive No. 1. It said, and I'm paraphrasing, rush into Manchuria and grab anything left behind by Japan. Directives 2 to 7 gave instructions how to deal with the surrendered Japanese, collaborators, Soviet troops, and others. By now, the entire north of China was honeycombed with red bases. This is where the undeclared civil war was first starting, Manchuria. The vanquished Japanese left a pretty massive vacuum once they surrendered. A month after it was all over, Mao set up the Northeast Bureau and put Peng Jun in charge there. Peng Jun, of course, will become the first one to fall in the Cultural Revolution. But in September 1945, he was Mao's trusted man on the scene to direct the CCP takeover of Manchuria. By year's end, Lin Biao will have 280,000 troops under his command there. Jiang, too, as soon as Hurley threw in the towel, rushed into Manchuria, aided by the U.S. military, who airlifted all the necessary troops to slow down Mao's big plans to get his hands on all that nice equipment and ammo. The U.S. pulled out all the stops for Jiang, and the Soviets did what they could to ensure that whatever they found went to the PLA. The race was on. The United Fronts were already ancient history. While all this was going on in Manchuria, Zhou Enlai was, of course, given the job of dealing with George Marshall. Zhou flew to Chongqing to meet him on December 22nd, 
1945. But at this juncture, in 1945 and into 1946, the PLA needed some time to sort itself out. There was a quantum leap between Jing Gangshan and Ray Jin and where the CCP found itself now. They didn't have the upper hand yet, but it was starting to seem possible. But with Marshall in the picture for now, precious time was handed to the communists to get organized and take a breather. As far as Marshall's discussions with Joe, all the low-hanging fruit was agreed to at the outset, and things started off on a hopeful note. They met six times between February and April 1946, but ceasefires are tricky things. Every time it seemed they had a deal, in fact, they did not. All throughout 1946, the KMT and CCP armies engaged in all kinds of skirmishes in the Northeast. Lin Biao was a very busy guy. In May 1946, the capital of the Republic of China was moved back to Nanjing. That's where Zhou resumed his discussions with Marshall. After all the easy stuff was agreed to, all the friendliness and good cheer had vanished. The same old issues kept coming up, and both sides were bending an inch. In a telegram to Mao on June 3rd, Joe had to give Mao the bad news that Marshall had turned into Patrick Hurley II, and there was zero chance he was ever going to side with the CCP on anything. Marshall kept thinking at the end of every session that both sides were going to pull back from the brink. But never did the hostilities come to a halt. Not with Manchuria at stake and all the rich pickings sitting there waiting for the first one to grab it. Jiang was not shy at all about defying Marshall. Then Zhou would rag on General Marshall that he was incapable of controlling Jiang. In the end, an exasperated Marshall announced that all American equipment on the ground in China belonged to Chiang Kai-shek's Nationalist Army. Both Mao and Zhou saw that, on the one hand, the U.S. was trying to broker a truce between two parties, but on the other hand, they were only supplying military aid to one side. On October 9th, Mao told Zhou to get back to Yan'an. November 19th, 1946, Zhou packed up and the entire delegation got on a plane and flew back to Yan'an. Mao had always known all this talk with the Americans would lead to naught, and in the end, he was proved right. The Americans, at this point, seemed pretty sure that the now rebranded since July PLA would have no chance against Jiang's massive armies backed with American military support. And besides this, ideologically, Mao and the Americans both knew the USA was incapable of making this leap of faith to give the CCP a chance. Not that a line in the sand needed to be drawn, but Jiang attacked and took the CCP stronghold of Zhang Jiakou on October 11th. At the same time, he called for a new constitutional assembly, and you'll never believe who didn't get invited to be part of this new government. So Mao Zedong told Zhou and Lai to come back. The diplomacy phase of the war had run its course. At this juncture, Mao needed Zhou the military advisor, not Zhou the diplomat. Let me quote Ad Arn Westad in his book, Decisive Encounters, describing Zhou during this period. Quote, Although few thought so at the time, it was to be Joe's longest stay behind enemy lines. It was also perhaps the end of the period of his best service to his party. Joe's tactical skills, the attractiveness of his personality, and his tremendous ability for deception contributed much toward the blossoming of interest in the CCP in the cities during his 12-month stay in the KMT capitals. While many urban Chinese had, until Zhou's arrival, viewed the communists as a sect of rural fanatics. In 1946, they had been charmed by the energetic propagandist and his young assistants into giving the CCP the benefit of the doubt. As the Civil War progressed, these changes were to have great significance. End quote. Once Jiang had all these American weapons, tanks, and equipment, given the size of his armies and the state of the PLA. He was at the peak of his power. Japan, gone. Soviets vacated the premises. He was in charge now. I don't know what Chiang Kai-shek was thinking in the summer of 1946. He had been trying for 20 years to get rid of these guys. And each time he came in for the kill, fate had always 
intervene to stay his hand or interfere with his careful plans. He had to finish them off this time, or else he himself was finished. Joe was Mao's vice chairman of the military council as well as chief of general staff. This pretty much made Joe, on the org chart, Mao's right-hand man for the remainder of the Civil War. The battle was on. Lin Biao was in the north commanding armies. Chan Yi was in Shandong. From past episodes, we remember how this all went, but let's just skim through it again. Into the second half of 1946 and clear through into the summer, Jiang's military went on the offensive and gave it to the PLA, but good. Towns were taken back, and more often than not, Mao's armies had to retreat from such overwhelming force. When the Nationalist Army turned their attention to Yan'an, Zhou had plenty of advance notice to plan the evacuation. This had been his job back in 1934, after the Fifth Encirclement campaign began. Zhou planned and led the evacuation of Rei Jin. Now they had to do it again. Zhou was very intent on having this one go a little smoother. Actually, Zhou had a spy in the Nationalist General Hu Zongnan's office who tipped them off. So they knew well in advance what was coming and how big of a force would be attacking. Yan'an had served the party center well since the end of the Long March in 1935. It was time to move on now. But as Mao said to Zhou as they left on March 14th, 1947, quote, We'll give Jiang Yan'an. He will give us China, end quote. Those two, Lingdao, were the last to leave. Next stop was further to the north of Shanxi in a village called Zaolinggo. Here, Mao and Zhou mapped out the plan. Zhou divided everyone up into three committees. The front committee would be Mao, Zhou, and Ren Bishir. They directed all military ops and told everyone what to do. The central working committee, led by Liu Shaoqi and Lin Biao, took orders from the front committee and based themselves in northeast Shanxi province. The rear committee also went to Shanxi along with most of the central committee. And one of their roles was to keep the CCP going in the event something happened to Mao or the other top leaders. Deng Yingchao went with this group. The other thing put in place, Mao called the Kunlun Detachment. They were run by the front committee. Zhou divided this Kunlun Detachment into four groups, military affairs, intel, radio communications, and the Xinhua News Agency. Zhou and Lai himself would ride from committee to committee by horseback, keeping the communications tight. I know we always picture Zhou and Lai impeccably dressed in his Mao suit, so elegant, meeting foreign dignitaries, performing his role as premier and diplomat. But as I said, on and off since about 1927, Zhou had always been someone traveling in disguise, walking dark alleys at night to clandestine meetings, traveling incognito with his head down, avoiding detection. And here, in 1947, on the back of a horse, liaising with the most key people leading this revolution. He was this hybrid that was part Talleyrand and Metternich and Che Guevara. From these northern bases, the PLA played a game of cat and mouse, striking whenever the nationalist troops fell into their traps. On May 4th, Peng Dehuai hit the jackpot when a raid at Pan Longzhen yielded 40,000 army uniforms and over a million pieces of equipment. 1947 sure started off good for Jiang, but by the fall of that year, he was already starting to sing, Where Have All the Good Times Gone? Side by side, Mao and Zhou worked together, directing operations and managing the war. They made a good team. By the end of 1947, Zhou Enlai was able to announce to everyone that the war had finally reached a tipping point and the CCP would soon be on the offensive for the first time since all this began. 32% of China was under CCP hands. The PLA had swelled now to 2.2 million soldiers. And not only this, besides the military strength, Zhou had invested over the years in software too. So hard he had worked to develop the so-called Second Front. These were students and intellectuals, mostly, who maybe weren't party members, but were on board with the communist agenda. 
that investment started to yield dividends in the form of protests and expressions of popular discontent against the government. Jiang was already dealing with a stronger-than-expected PLA, economic collapse, and now popular outrage across a wide swath of society. Well, 1948 was going to get a lot worse for the nationalists, and the crescendo will build until about the failure of the gold yen and the launch of the Liaoshan campaign. For Zhou and the top leadership, the balance of the Civil War was going to be managed from the town of Xibaipo. This was about a two-day march to the northwest of Shijiazhuang in Hebei. They moved in there April 1948, and it was in Xibaipo where Mao and Zhou directed the balance of the Civil War. The Liaoshan, Huaihai, and Pingjin campaigns were all run out of this base. January 21st, 1949, Jiang Kai-shek stepped down, and Li Zongren replaced him as president during one of the darkest, if not the darkest, moment in KMT history. Now they had been reduced to reaching out to the CCP for some kind of deal. Mao gave him his terms on January 14th. What followed was, I guess, payback for all those years, going back to the time the CCP had been founded. They had been harassed, intimidated, murdered en masse, assassinated, and chased all over China. The communists, after every disastrous turn of events, kept coming back. And each time, he almost had them in a corner. All these outside forces kept foiling Jiang's plans. The Russians, the Japanese, the Americans, the Xi'an incident. After Jiang resigned as president, he went to his hometown in Shiko, just outside of Ningbo. There, he reflected on his life and the failures that surely history would pin on him. It was no more Mr. Nice Guy when Zhou Enlai faced down his KMT opponents upon the commencement of peace negotiations on April 1st. So many years, Zhou had faced these men as an inferior. Now he faced them as a conqueror and handed them very harsh terms of surrender on April 15th. He told them they had five days to consider, and it was take it or leave it. And if they didn't accept, the PLA would cross the Yangtze, and finish them off in the south. The north of China already belonged to the communists. April 20th, Jiang and Li Tongren rejected Zhou's offer, and sure enough, just as advertised, Mao called for the PLA to cross the Yangtze. On April 23rd, they captured the capital, Nanjing. You might remember from that Deng Xiaoping episode part two, this was the moment Deng and Chen Yi, after taking Nanjing, got to have some fun and goof on Jiang Kai-shek by taking turns sitting at his desk in the presidential palace. At this point, 1948-1949, there was no question anymore whether the communists would come out on top. It was just a matter of when. And by mid-1949, the end was safely in sight. Setting up a new government after decades of destruction and turmoil on a national scale is one of those things that's harder than you think. Here again, Zhou Enlai rose to the occasion and stepped up to spearhead this gargantuan task. Years later, the leaders would all say they hadn't expected to win so quickly. When Zhou announced that a tipping point had been reached in December 1947, a need suddenly arose to start planning for what if and when. Winning the war and losing the peace was not what Zhou or any of the leadership wanted. So, just like Jefferson Adams, Franklin, Hamilton, Jay, Madison, and others had to do in the late 18th century with the USA, so Zhou Enlai had to do. Mao Zedong thought was one thing, but it wasn't going to help with the administration and management of the country. Zhou had to start planning for that. He didn't do it alone, but he was the main guy. Zhou knew the particular importance that foreign relations were going to play once the new nation was established. Early on, Zhou had started grooming all kinds of future MFA personnel. There were a lot of people who traveled with Zhou and were his assistants over the years. You could learn a lot having Zhou and Lai as a boss. I often say, Zhou did this, Zhou did that, and Zhou met with this person. It wasn't Zhou and Lai by himself all the time. Someone as important and high profile as Zhou always traveled with an entourage. Many of these people seeded the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. P.K. Banerjee, 
India's charge d'affaires in uh, Beijing during the Sino-Indian dust-up in October-November 1962, once wrote a book about Zhou Enlai. He had said, quote, One could always tell whether a man or a woman was trained by Zhou Enlai. To begin with, he or she is a workaholic. Secondly, never will that person be slipshod in anything. Whatever he or she does is a total commitment, end quote. So all throughout the climax of the Civil War and into the mop-up phase, Zhou Enlai was drafting the blueprints for the new Chinese state. While the bullets were still flying, the outline for the common program that served as the first constitution of the PRC was put together. Zhou gave an interesting speech on May 7, 1949, at the National Youth Congress. Although the speech was called Learn from Mao Zedong, the content involved a dire warning against the deification of the chairman. Joe said, quote, You must not regard Mao as a chance leader, a born leader, a demigod. If you do, it will be empty talk. Making Mao a deity apart, that's the kind of leader publicized in feudal and capitalist societies. Our leader is born of the Chinese people, born of China's revolution. In learning from Mao Zedong, we must learn in the light of his own historical development, not just looking at his great achievement today and neglecting the process of his growth. Mao Zedong was superstitious in childhood, but yesterday's superstitious child was able to become today's Chairman Mao. His greatness lies in the fact that he dared to face up to the past. End quote. No wonder that speech didn't get published till 1978. Somewhere along the line, everything with respect to this new Chinese state had to be made official. Once the nationalists were having their going-out-of-business sale in the mainland, someone needed to set things straight for all. It was decided the best way to start off would be with something akin to what happened in 1945 after the war ended when a political consultative congress was created that included several parties. Joe was put in charge, naturally, of the preparatory committee. The first of what soon came to be known as the CPPCC, or Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, was held September 21st to the 30th, 1949. Zhou invited the KMT to participate and become part of the new China as one party among many. The CCP was the only one that counted, but this forum was one where non-CCP organizations could have a voice in China's future. The meeting was held with 134 members representing 23 organizations and eight democratic parties. At this first CPPCC meeting, they made a few big decisions. They settled on the name of People's Republic of China, the Chinese flag, the national anthem, and the first slate of government leaders were announced. It was also announced that the capital was being moved to Beijing and that the place wasn't called Beiping anymore. And then, on the very next day, after the conference closed on the last day of September, Mao stood on Tiananmen and declared the founding of the new China. Man, that was one hard slog. I wonder if Mao was thinking about that night more than 28 years ago when the first party congress was held, right where Xin Tiandi is today in Shanghai, and how they all had to scatter and finish the meeting on a tour boat on South Lake in Jiaxing. He had been on the run on and off, ever since, and now came this great day. He wouldn't have made it this far without Zhou Enlai. Zhou stood there with Mao, to the side, just to his left, when he said his famous words about China standing up. Zhou was now 51 years old and the new premier of the new China. Mao was 56. Both men had 27 more years to live. And in part five, we will at last look at Zhou Enlai as he begins his illustrious career as the premier of the People's Republic of China. As far as the U.S. and China were concerned, once George Marshall left in January 1947, there were no friendly relations until Nixon opened the door in 1972. Zhou's early years, his France period, the roles he played as an up-and-comer in the nascent Chinese Communist movement attracted the Soviets early on. And they saw Zhou Enlai was a pretty sharp guy, and this led to his appointment at the Wampoa Military Academy. There, in Guangdong Province, Zhou began his long, on-again, off-again, tortured relationship with Chiang Kai-shek. And he also met Mao Zedong for the first time. 
Then for two decades following the Shanghai massacre, Joe was on the run, hiding from Jiang's secret police and working undercover to keep the party alive, recruit new members, and infiltrate the KMT organs of power. There would be moments when Joe was able to work openly. The first and second United Fronts, the Xi'an incident, and when the Americans came and tried in vain to build a coalition government. When Zhou Enlai walked onto the world stage in the mid-1930s, he at once built up quite a nice reputation as a worthy diplomatic opponent. His reputation as an astute, helpful, well-connected, mild-mannered, nice guy, however, belied a side of Joe that was dark indeed and kept well hidden. He was loyal to the CCP first and foremost. During the three decades of the 20s, 30s, and 40s, the demise of the party through violent means almost happened. When all seemed lost or damaged beyond repair, Joe picked up the ball and kept things alive. At every moment of crisis during these three turbulent decades, Joe was there in a leadership role. And when an act of revenge needed to be carried out or murder committed, Joe never hesitated to give the order. He never lost sight of the big picture. If he personally had to leave a few bodies in his wake, that decision was nothing for Joe and Lai to make. But he was no Mao Zedong, that's for sure. Joe knew this, too. Despite his high ranking in the party almost since the beginning, he never aspired to be number one. He was more of a grand chancellor type. And in the months leading up to the Yi conference, when it came time for Joe to choose who he thought would be best for the future of the CCP, he chose Mao Zedong. Mao didn't become the top guy all by himself. Joe made it easier for Mao to get to the top of the pops. And once Joe said he supported Mao, those who weren't sure were still undecided. They, too, on the strength of their belief in Zhou Enlai's wisdom and experience, began to accept Mao's leadership. Zhou is usually looked at in his capacity as the consummate diplomat premier. That's how I and many best remember him. The Geneva Conference, Bandong, Nixon. But he was also a military man. He wasn't like Zhu De, Peng De Huai, or Chen Yi, out fighting battles, though he fought in quite a few. He was Mao's right-hand man, directing the most crucial moments of the Civil War. Not only did he direct the course of the war with Mao, he had to take on the responsibility of what to do after the guns were silent and Jiang was defeated. It's hard enough starting up a company, let alone a nation with half a billion people, ravaged by 20 years of the most savage warfare and almost 100 years of humiliating imperialism. A lot of stuff needed to be thought up from scratch. Mao was the theory guy. Joe was the practical nuts and bolts guy. Getting China up and running was Joe's main job. So that's all for next time. Thinking of a last-minute holiday gift? How about my Pu-RT gift set? Comes in a nice package. Don't even have to gift wrap it. Two 100-gram Pu-Chas. A 2006 Sheng Pu-R from the Menghai Tea Factory of Xishuang Ba Na. And a 2015 Shou Pu-R from the famous Xiaguan Tea Factory located in Dali, Yunnan Province. Two of the most renowned Pu-RT factories located in the land that brought this great gift to the world. As part of the special deal worked out with my tea friends at tsends.com, you also get your choice of four designs of gaiwans. And to pry the tea leaves from that nice, enjoyable, healthy pu'ar tocha, we're throwing in a free tea pick. Come on, man, do it just like the pros. You all no doubt remember gaiwans. These are covered tea bowls introduced during the Ming Dynasty but became de rigueur during the Qing Go to tsense.com and get yours now. That's T E A S E N Z.com. The perfect gift for Poo R lovers everywhere. So many of you write me and ask me, how can I donate to the CHP? You know something? No need to send me anything. Go check out my tea. Just like Dan Carlin gets with his Amazon search bar. Same with me on the CHP Poo R T gift set. Get a little piece of that. And that allows the CHP to keep going just a little bit longer. So, go show some love. 
Hey, you also might want to check out Elias Belhadad's new and noteworthy history podcast, available in the iTunes Store and elsewhere, the History of Islam podcast. I've been listening. Elias is covering pre-Islamic Arabia right now. You can also find this at History of Islam Podcast dot blogspot dot co dot uk i'll have a link on my website i'll be out in paris end of january any listeners out there want to hook up and meet email me at laszlo at china history podcast dot com honestly other than a plane change at cdg 20 years ago i've never been there before can you believe it I heard there's still a few copies left of the Ant Hills Anthology. While we're here, you can get it at EarnshawBooks.com. That's right, the same one I said before, where you can find quality books on China and beyond. The Anthill.org, writing about China since even before the Shabbata. I'm not promising anything, but I'm going to try and squeeze out one last episode before this year, 2015, comes to an end. Going to be up in. Northern Cal all next week, so I'll be on the run. On behalf of the whole CHP team here, all my research interns, assistants, and PhDs, everyone in production and accounting, good old gum jie brings us the milk tea, 3 p.m., like clockwork. This is Laszlo Montgomery beseeching you to join me next time for another exciting episode of the Joe and Lai History Podcast.